And today I'd like to talk about the role of air power in the course of World War II. World War II, of course, is the word we use in America, and it's equivalent to the European or the British notion of a second world war. There's a couple of things to remember about air power before we begin in earnest. One is that there was an enormous transformation between its inaugural appearance in 1914 in World War I when pilots and biplanes shot revolvers at each other. In less than 30 years, about 25 years, 24 years, at the outbreak in September 1st of 1939 in World War II, we had monoplanes and the speeds had increased from 100 miles an hour to nearly 300, and people were firing about seven to 800 shots per minute on machine guns, sometimes right through the propeller, sometimes on the wings. And they were carrying bomb loads, in the case of fighter bombers, of 500 to 1,000 pounds, and bombers even far greater. So there was a miraculous transformation in the role of air power. And that created theorists or prophets, air prophets, or architects of air power, so to speak, in the European countries and in the United States as well. Billy Mitchell, Duet, Weaver in Germany, and they were so enthralled by this new weapon that they made a, a series of astounding predictions, and so much that Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin in the late 1930s said in despair that the bomber will always get through. And it was almost as if assets at sea, navies, and assets on the ground, infantry, were going to be secondary or even irrelevant. The war would take place up in the air. The problem with that is nobody lives up in the air, nobody eats in the air, nobody uh, really can fly. We don't have wings. So what you're doing is transferring label, labor and capital from the ground up into the air. And there has to be a purpose for that. And the purpose had to be either air superiority or air supremacy. And by that I mean your air forces had to beat the other person's air forces for the prime reason that they could then direct their assets to where things really mattered on the ground, taking cities or territory, or killing people or capturing them on the ground. If you couldn't do that and you only achieved air parity, then both sides were sort of wasting their time in an irrelevant theater. So the purpose was to build more planes and better planes and train better pilots to destroy the enemy's air assets, or at least weaken them so you had air superiority. And then the holy grail was air supremacy. That meant that you could put your assets up in the air, they could fly over the enemy's territory, destroy his cities or his armies on the ground, and they would be invulnerable because you had destroyed the enemy's ability to fight back in the air. And that was pretty much the theory of air power in World War II. 